So we have learned to do some stuff with vectors. We've learned to add them and subtract them and perform scalar multiplication. And vectors, even though it's not always useful to think about them in this way, vectors are just a special kind of matrix. So that raises the kind of natural question, if we can add, subtract, and scale their multiply vectors, can we add, subtract, and scale their multiply other matrices? And the answer is yes. And it's done in what I would describe as the natural way. Just like we can only add or subtract vectors of the same size, we can only add and subtract matrices of the same size. And it's done component-wise. So first row, first column, first row, first column, we add those together. First row, second column, first row, second column, we add those together. Second row, first column, second row, first column, And finally, second row, second column, second row, second column. And subtraction in just the same way. Scale the multiplication. again, works just the same it does for vectors. That is to say, if you scaled or multiply a vector, you just take all of the numbers in the vector and multiply them by the scalar. Same thing with matrices. And this matrix arithmetic is, is intuitive. It acts in the way you'd expect it to act. And we'll summarize that. And even though I told you not to memorize it, this list of properties that matrix arithmetic has may hopefully look familiar because it's exactly the list of properties that I said vector arithmetic has. So addition is commutative and associative. The zero matrix doesn't get any special 
notation. We just write the number zero and you use context clues to figure out that this must be the matrix of all zeros. But adding zero doesn't do anything. Adding a matrix and its um, additive inverse gives you the zero matrix. Multiplication distributes over addition. And this happens in a few different ways. If you're adding the matrices, multiplication distributes over addition. And if you're adding the scalars, multiplication distributes over addition. This scalar multiplication commutes. and scale their multiplication by one doesn't do anything. And I know I went through that list fast, but again, these are, I when I first introduced vectors in 1.3, I put up an eight element list of properties that they have. And this list is that list, except that instead of vectors, we have matrices. And once again, the take home message of all of this is that this acts the way you'd expect it to. These are all very normal properties that the real numbers have. The real meat of this section though, is matrix. Matrix We are going to learn to multiply two matrices together. And I mean, we've already done an example of this. If you think of vectors as a special kind of matrix, we've already learned to multiply matrices by vectors. When we multiply a matrix by a vector, the dimensions have to match. Same thing when we're multiplying two matrices. And when I say the dimensions have to match, I mean that those two inside numbers have to be the same. The number of columns of the first matrix has to be the number of rows in the second. And the way we define this multiplication is not immediately intuitive, but it's basically the only way we could define this multiplication. If you think, I mean, if you think of addition and subtraction, and you say, well, why don't you just learn to multiply matrices that have the same size 
and we'll do that multiplication component wise, just like we do here. That has all kinds of problems. First of all, as I say, vectors are matrices, and we've already learned to multiply matrices and vectors, and matrices and vectors aren't of the same size, and that multiplication we do isn't component-wise like this. So if we defined multiplication that way, we'd have sort of two types of matrix multiplication, which I guess wouldn't be the end of the world, but also, I mean, at the end of the day, it can be hard to think of it when you're learning theorems and stuff, but this is applied math. If we learn to multiply this way, it doesn't give us any useful applications. And that, at the end of the day, is really why we don't do it. If we define matrix matrix multiplication in the way we're going to, we get all sorts of powerful applications to all the areas you can imagine. We'll talk about linear regression that's done this way. We'll talk about applications to probability. Anyway, though, I've put this off long enough and maybe I've kind of oversold it. It's a little weird, but not that weird. We've already seen the main idea, which is that we often think of matrices as being basically vector storage units. That is to say, we often think of the columns of a matrix as being vectors that are just sitting next to each other. And if we think of B in that way, then the product A times B isn't that unintuitive. We're just going to take each of these columns and we're going to multiply it. What multiply them one by one by the matrix A. And that's matrix matrix multiplication. It's um its power, as I say, probably isn't immediately apparent, but it is a very powerful definition. And this, let me see. No, no, I was thinking, do I want to do anything else in the next five minutes? But probably having defined this, it's a natural place to end this. And we'll pick up on Thursday.